Hello, I'm James, and I like to both restore and colourise old photographs. And today, I'm going to be working with this 1862 Civil War era photograph of former slaves who had either escaped to, or been rescued by, the Union forces. I'll be talking about the restoration and colouring processes using Photoshop, while also explaining why these people were referred to as contraband by the military forces they now found themselves with. So this was a relatively straightforward restoration. While there were some reasonably damaged areas of the image, they were well distanced from the main subjects and generally in areas where I could easily sample from nearby, non-damaged areas to repair them. The left hand side corners were slightly more complicated as these areas were entirely missing, but they were only more time consuming to tackle via the same sampling methods, not more complicated. I did find myself having to draw a bit of a line under just how many of the very small parts of damage I would actually repair however. An image this old will generally have thousands of small marks and scratches which would potentially take weeks to manually remove if you wanted to remove every single slight imperfection. I therefore focused on repairing the larger, more easily noticeable areas of damage, and then removing everything smaller I could which covered the people posing in the image. A lot of restoring photographs is working out how much time you have to work on a particular image and prioritising your approach based on that workload. It's very true to say that the old adage of art is never finished, only abandoned rings very true for image restoration and colourisation. This is the second large group portrait which I've colourised. For my previous attempt, the image of the German World War I soldiers recovering in a hospital at Christmas, I found myself rather pressed for time to complete it. For that reason, I did everything I could to speed up my working processes with that image. For example, I mass coloured in all the skin tones at once using the same colours for everyone, and then I went in and manually tweaked the hue and saturation values on the separate faces to add some colour variants. I also had the advantage that many of the uniforms the soldiers were wearing were obviously, by design, near identical which allowed me to reuse the same layers multiple times. For two reasons, I didn't want to use the same time-saving methods with this particular image of the former slaves. Firstly, I wasn't entirely happy with the end results I reached with the picture of the German soldiers. I was very happy with the results, considering the time I had available to work on that image, but I feel that had I gone through that picture with more of a fine-tooth, individualistic approach, the end image result may have been improved. I don't wish to sell that previous image short however, I don't feel that a difference in approach would have made an amazingly big difference in outcome, possibly 10% maximum overall increase in quality for potentially spending twice the time and hours working on it. The main reason driving me to want to use more precise methods when working with this image was the subject matter. So when I said earlier that the Union forces referred to the former slaves as contraband, this was due to the legal situation in America during the early stages of the Civil War. Under the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, escaped slaves were legally required to be returned to their original owners. However, some people, such as Major General Benjamin Butler, felt that once certain states had decided to secede themselves from the United States, that particular law no longer applied to these now foreign countries. Therefore, when escaped slaves had successfully reached the Union States, they were not returned. This later became established law. This picture is titled, Cumberland Landing, VA, Group of Contrabands at Foller's House. Despite the fact that obviously the people in this picture had found themselves in a far better position than they had been as slaves, I think it would be fair to say that they were still somewhat treated as a piece of property, as a contraband of war to be triumphantly displayed. I was wary of approaching the colourisation of these people as a group, using mass colouring methods and not giving them their due respect as individuals. For this reason I decided to colour each person in the image separately, as if it were an individual portrait of just one person. In hindsight, this working method decision was potentially a mistake. One of the biggest risks I find when colouring is getting too attached to the subjects in the picture. It can lead to me making decisions from my heart and ignoring the logic in my head. I spent roughly 20 hours working on this image. Had I been willing to even take on a few slightly time-saving methods, I would have potentially cut a third of that time out without sacrificing any quality from the end result at all. This project raised a really interesting question for me, 
which I feel will increasingly be asked in the colorization community, and probably in the art community more generally. What matters more, the end result you reach creatively, or the way that the end result was achieved? As artificial intelligence continues to be used more and more in photo and video restoration, and also colorization, the computer generated results will only improve. Computer created colorizations, for example, are currently rather poor in comparison to what a human can create manually, but it's hard to ignore how quickly these automated methods are improving. There will inevitably come a time, I feel, when computers will be able to precisely and faithfully colour historical images perfectly in a matter of seconds. It may not happen for a decade or two, hopefully, but I think it's coming. At that point, for people such as myself who colour manually, it will entirely be the heart and soul we put into our work which gives it meaning, as the same identical image, from a technical point of view, could be generated non-humanly in a slight fraction of the time. While I feel I could have definitely made my process more streamlined and saved myself some working time with this image, I wouldn't have spent anywhere near as much time looking at the image and really taking it, and the people within it, to heart. This colourisation was really rewarding to work on. Colouring this picture as I did, person by person, really emphasised both the massive human cost of the slave trade, while also highlighting just how recently it actually occurred in historical terms. Any image where I feel utterly miserable upon finishing it was probably a good one to colour, I feel. I hope I've managed to do the people in this picture justice with this colourisation. Being neither African American, nor American of any kind, I'm always acutely aware when I work on an image from outside of the UK such as this, that I'm somewhat a visitor in someone else's cultural history. I've done what I can to be historically accurate and to take what is a serious subject seriously, but please let me know in the comments if I've made any historical errors with my colouring of this photograph and I'll certainly bear it in mind for future images I work on. If you enjoyed this video, I have a lot more on this channel, and even more to come in the future if you'd like to subscribe. Also, feel free to suggest any historical subjects or individuals you'd like to see me work on. Thanks for watching.